Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 178 of Real Blend, a podcast that thinks Field of Dreams is overrated. Oh, I am God. Sean O'Connell, <laughs> the managing here, editor man. of Cinema Blend, and on what? this week's show, it this podcast doesn't believe shit. We're going to have box office talk, uh, mainly uh, the the fact that Free Guy uh, had to change his name to Expensive Guy uh, in, in light of the... Uh, <laughs> Why wasn't that your joke? <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about The Night House, uh, starring Rebecca Hall, and the twist of that one is that it stars the Green Knight, um, and then Neil Blomkamp is going to be Ooh. our guest, talking about his new film, Demonic. Sorry that I'm in a mood. You just throw it. You got too many jokes. You I just throw it it's, an, it's an abundance. Um, and so I'm going to introduce the guys first and foremost. Uh, Gabe Kovach, join us yet again. If you listen to the premium episode, you'll know that Gabe is filling in for Kevin, who's on vacation. So hi, Gabe. How are you? They won't know because that is going up next week. So they're finding out for the first time that I'm that I'm filling in. That's super confusing. We shouldn't record for, premium for first. you. Yeah we, yeah, we already recorded premium. Yes, I'm yeah. here. I'm, I'm shuffling boxes. If you're watching on YouTube, I was in Jake's box. I'm in Kevin's box. Wait, we have our own boxes? Yeah. Got your little names on them. Mm -hmm. They're set in place. Do you ever watch a YouTube video? I appreciate your effort. You should watch the YouTube version of the show, Jake. You're very handsome in it. The other uh, voice is Jake Hamilton. No, uh, you've already offended me with this whole film. Box 32 in Chicago. <laughs> well, I, we're going to get to that in a little yeah, you're, bit. You're so. building an ass whooping and I'm coming to it. Let's get to some housekeeping if you're watching us on YouTube. Hello. Thank you so much for joining the show um, and taking part of the visual aspect of it. Uh, please head down, give us a like and a subscribe, as everybody on YouTube likes to do. Oh, go and subscribe to Jake's channel as yes! well, too. I'm this Jake close! Is, Jake is dangerously close. close. So, what Do you get, like, a silver button? Is that the silver yeah, button? Yeah, silver button. Daily? And your, your page followers? becomes uh, verified. Uh, I wonder what that's like. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for audio listeners, um, if you want to join us on the video form, we have... Uh, a channel over at youtube.com backslash real blend podcast. We appreciate you going over there and giving us a follow. Uh, and of course we're available wherever you get your podcast needs met. I want to know if you guys have signed up for real blend premium. Uh, it turns out that we recorded an episode already for this week uh, and it's going <laughs> to drop on Monday. Like all of the episodes tend to drop. And in addition to these Monday episodes, you also get an ad free version of the podcast and an extra, uh, well, a newsletter that I write every other week. Um, and I had a fun one. This, yes, I know Daenerys. Um, she's pissed off about you. the Field of Dreams comments. She's a big fan of the newsletter, Daenerys. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can go over to cinemablend.com backslash realblendpremium. That's cinemablend.com backslash realblendpremium to sign up for, uh, for that. So, hey, guess what? We're having a watch party. Uh, we're going to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark together as a group. I don't know if as, I want to anymore. As the well. Real Blend family. Uh, and... <laughs> We'll watch Field of Dreams instead. Then, how about that? That's what. No, they I have. just watched it. Oh, yeah, we'll watch, we can watch it. the Field you, of Dreams TV show. You lived it, Jake. I lived it. You didn't watch oh, it. Wow. You lived it. Uh, the watch party is going to be August thirtieth at five p.m. Pacific, eight p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're going to live tweet along our reactions and insights into Raiders of the Lost Ark using the hashtag Cinema Blend Movie Club because it's the Real Blend guys, and then it's a bunch of Cinema Blend staff folk will be participating as lo along too. I think we're going to transition from Raiders into the other Indiana Jones films. So I'm sorry, um, we're gonna, we're doing what? Well, uh, Cinema Blend might. I'm not quite sure if, if Real Blend will continue with that, but transition into we'll go from Raiders. I into, thought you were saying we weren't going to do best. Raiders. We were going to do like Temple, to which I was going to be busy that day. No, oh, no. Temp but Temple's the best one. It's not though. It's not bad though. You talk about it no. like it's. Four. But it's but it's, it's in in the, in the same way that like Stop. Revenge of the Sith is not bad, but it's not better than Empire. Okay, but like that's why a, are you talking? Why? It's good drastic. though. Revenge it's actually Sith is great. Good. It's actually great, oh, dude. I legit no joke. I hate the opening. I hate the opening. Yeah, you've mentioned that. <sighs> Maybe anything, you should join us for goes. when we live tweet that and discuss it and see how the Wait, busy that day. What was the movie just recently that you told me is a masterpiece? Oh, Batman Returns. I, that yes, was it unusual. Is. I love Batman Returns. Oh my god, dude! I'm, I'm in the middle sure. of watching it right now. Just the art direction, mm -hmm. it, like the it's beautiful. It's like beautiful. again, like you're watching it again. Well, because I'm in a I'm in a mood because my Michael Keaton interview did really well, so I've like wanted to like rewatch. <laughs> you never you never do that. You never like have an interview go really well with an actor, and so it kind of makes you want to like watch that actor's movie. You, you know, never experience that. Average any average Joe or Jane can really relate to that. You just ever you ever talk to a famous person and you want to watch their movies? <laughs> I was gonna say my interviews never really go go well. So 
<laughs> and I never get a chance to go back and visit their filmography. Uh, listen, we also have a, bu- a bonus episode that's coming that you guys are really going to enjoy. It's going to drop on Friday, and it is with M. Night Shyamalan's daughter, Ishana Shyamalan. She ran second unit direction on Old uh, most recently, and she grew up on M. Night's sets and has some amazing stories to tell about her trying to break into the film industry and the types of movies that she wants to make uh, and the work that they did on Old. So that is a bonus episode that you guys are absolutely going to want to tune into. I'm excited to listen to that one. It drops on Friday. Yeah, I was bummed you couldn't take part in it. Um, Kevin and I held down the fort for that one. Um, She's great. She's really, really entertaining. You're going to enjoy all the stories she has to tell. Okay, let's get to the weekly poll because I want to leave some room for us to have this discussion. So I put down... And this is this was definitely inspired by uh, Jake's trip to Iowa for the Field of Dreams festivities, which, by the way, your coverage was incredible. Um, Thank you, and brother. yeah, you did an amazing job of covering. It made me honestly feel like I was there, uh, and and had all the little Jake flourishes too, because you you think ahead and do the extra mile, like you had the cameraman coming out of the corn, you know, catching up with you as you were like mid mid. Uh, I don't know, what is that, monologue? I want to call it a monologue, but it's not really. Um, you had access to all the drone footage that Fox used, and it was just fantastic. Go over to Jake's YouTube channel. And, is it on your YouTube channel? Is that where you're putting not it? Not yet, not yet. Okay, well, soon it'll be up there. Uh, so I asked what the quintessential the quintessential baseball movie was. It's also Dog Days of Summer. Like, it's, you know, this good baseball yeah. on television now. Can we and, agree uh, that the, the sport of baseball yields the best sports movies? Yeah, I think oh. that's fair. I think well, that's d- fair. D- Gabe, uh, g- give me your give me your refute. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I just don't, I think maybe I just don't like baseball enough to just accept that blindly. Really? Um, I don't. The mind only baseball. one that I would defer to is basketball because I think there are a lot of basketball really good basketball great, movies. I mean, but are, are there it's a little oversaturated? That many great basketball movies. Basketball movies are a little oversaturated. I would say there are more great football movies than there are great basketball. Sure, movies. I was going to throw up football as well. That's great. I don't really know but if there I, I feel are like I can, great football I can, movies. Yeah, Friday Night Lights. Yeah, that's not a great movie. Remember you like the show? No, Friday Night Lights is great. You like the show? I love the show. It's one of the all-time great shows Sunday? in the history of television, and I, I really love Any Given Sunday. Well, you're forgetting on the basketball side, though, Teen Wolf. No, I believe you mean movie? Teen Wolf Two. No, that's a boxing movie. Yeah, Jason Bateman was a boxer in that one. Really? Hmm. I only ever seen it. They couldn't just do basketball again. That would have been a ripoff. Yeah, that would have like been. It, like all the Air Buds? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hey. I own a lot of those Air Buds, by the way, because I have kids. Let's, get, they, to the, let's get to the poll because you want to argue have to? this out. This is kind of fun. Uh, so it was tough coming up with the choices for this because one of them you have to leave is other. Because you're clearly not going to cover every baseball movie yeah. uh, known to mankind. So I went with uh, three that I believe really should be in the conversation for quintessential baseball movie oh wow look at this is this the youtube uh results yes because the twitter results were really close did you notice that no i didn't i pulled youtube because we usually get more uh i'll pull that up and and throw it in there for you just because i'm curious all right so the choices i gave people were uh the natural moneyball and bull durham as the three i thought and and mind you that means that I'm leaving out a number of of tremendous movies, you know, yeah. really, really strong baseball movies that Jake is going to now tell me why uh, one of them in particular. Now, do you actually believe that it's not only should be in contention, but that it should win? Yes, no. I would are like I think Field of Dreams is not only the greatest baseball movie of all time. I think it's one of the greatest sports movies of all time Interesting. Um, because and it goes back to my, my whole tried and true stand on a on a soapbox and speech uh, about like the best sports movies aren't about sports. They're like, you know, it's it's not it has nothing to do with baseball. Like the reason to me, the reason Moneyball works is it's about breaking down like a century old tradition. Like that's 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 what's amazing about Moneyball is you've got a group of people and that, that are breaking down something that people have accepted for 100 years with Field of Dreams. It has nothing to do with baseball it has to do with mm-hmm. a cool. man like about dreams that we never got to fulfill, whether mm-hmm. it's the dream of, of playing a professional sport, whether it's the dream of like. I really wish I'd made up things with my father before he passed. Like we never really did get to have that catch. Like those are all things people can relate to. You put it within mm-hmm. the prism of sports. It's very romantic. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's fantasyful. Fantasyful. That's not right. Um, fantastical, fantastical. fantastical. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but I, 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 I feel the dreams, man. And it was weird. And, and, and it goes back to, to a, a phrase that, that you say, Sean, that I absolutely love. And you're absolutely right. Which is that movies don't change. We change. Mm-hmm. And I recently rewatched feel of dreams. For the, for the first time, probably a couple of years. It's, it's not a yearly rewatch for me. Um, 
And it, it, the ending hit me harder. The dad want to have a catch mm. um, hit me harder than it ever has before. Mm. And I it just and, and I think that's just as we're getting older and, you know, like, you know, you start seeing your parents get older and and oh, my God, I cried. Oh, my God. And just that, that moment, that beat where, where Kevin says, Dad, mm. because you realize up to that moment, he's never called him dad before. He always mm. refers to him as his, he re- introduces his daughter by, by saying this is, you know, his name. And then he refers to himself uh, as, as by his name. And then that moment where he says, dad, and it always made me wonder, like in that moment, did he know that he was his father? Like did that, you know, oh my God, it's just, just tears, ugly tears, like a <laughs> gagging cry. Interesting. Now here's where I'm going to refute what you just said. Sure. You essentially made the argument that uh, Field of Dreams isn't even about baseball. So how on earth can it be the quintessential baseball movie if it's not actually about baseball? Because the best sports movies aren't about the sports under which they're like. So like you guys are coming of, at this from. So you guys are coming at this from two different sets of criteria. For sure. I, I, I would yeah, like I the believe... best baseball movie to be about baseball. Nah, I do. I mean, still about by, baseball. Like, like Field of Dreams is very much about baseball. No, but by they that cut measure, out corn man. By that measure, I think by what Sean was saying, Moneyball kind of wins because that's like. You know, I I, I liked, learned so I much, much better about baseball. When Kevin was on this show. Well, um, yes, yeah, we'll 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 keep the, going. The, the history, game. like the, like the White Sox, and they like they cheated and Shoeless Joe. Like you get there's you know a lot very about much. That. It's very much ingrained in uh, Field of Dreams. Sure. The yes, the the quintessential baseball movie should not be about a team that cheated in order to win. Now I know as an Astros fan, that's where you're going to defer to. <laughs> 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 you set yourself up for that, man. Yeah. That was an easy one. Um, so in the poll, Moneyball. What are they going to cr- call that movie? Oh, that's a good question. The field of garbage cans? <laughs> I don't know. What Whenever they... you guys are, are, are sitting at home field not watching your teams cans. in October, you have plenty of time to think about it. Because we're one of the best teams in the American League, sucker. Right. Well, no, what they... I think I have, uh, what do we got, like 12 championships? That's fine. What was the uh, the nickname? The Trash Tros? Is that what they called them? The Trash Tros. Trash Tros. What the hell is going on with this episode? <laughs> It's a little off the rails. Um, Moneyball ended up crushing in the poll. It uh, on, on YouTube, the, yeah. On YouTube, it did fifty four percent. Yeah. Um, other did twenty one percent, and then the Natural did thirteen, and Bull Dorm did did twelve. The other reason why the Natural didn't do that well is because I'm the only old person on this show. Have you even seen the Natural? Have you have you seen the Natural either See, of you? To me, the, the Natural is so schmaltzy. I haven't it seen is. it since I was a kid. It's yeah. very schmaltzy. It's very schmaltzy. The the ones I saw underneath uh that were mentioned many many times sandlot was mentioned a ton sure by people See, if kevin were here kevin would be flipping out about sandlot probably a league of the um, was mentioned a lot league of yeah. was mentioned a lot 42 42 was one that came up that's another good one and major yeah. league i think major There's league is tremendous There's yeah a that, ton that's, of baseball that's movies. the thing it's really it is really really hard so yeah. i was glad to see people giving Moneyball. god G- i love I know, Moneyball. i know you love it yeah. i love money Moneyball was on my top 10 of the decade list terrific movie love yeah. Moneyball. like yeah. like one of brad pitt's best performances some yeah. of aaron sorkin's best work like that that's um that conversation he has with the gm of the red Sox uh at fenway at the oh, very yeah, end yeah. about the whole like someone's got to be the first one through the door and they're going to get the slings and arrows i mean oh yeah. it's just uh, it's it's I, I i'm not trying to besmirch Moneyball because i love 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 Moneyball. um so i i just think i mean feel that, like to, to not even make field of dreams an option <laughs> seems well i did uh, that to annoy i really well, did that to well, mission you. accomplished dude <laughs> <laughs> the uh the money ball scene that i go back and watch often in a similar way to the way that i watch the uh few good men courtroom scene just because it's yeah. vintage uh sorkin is brad pitt around the table with all the very old scouts yeah, telling yeah, him yeah. who he's going to look at and he, and he keeps pointing at jonah hill why are we why are we looking at him because he my, gets on my, base <laughs> my favorite is um is uh you guys are, are are looking for the same old nonsense like we're looking for fabio and then you hear one guy on the table go who's fabio and then you hear another guy very softly in the distance go i think he plays shortstop <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great all right let's get to this week's interview um and of course continue to weigh in on your choices for quintessential baseball films uh because i want to hear uh how divisive this conversation is um we had neil blomkamp uh on the show or he's about to be on the show he has a new film coming out called demonic and people might recognize neil from um elysium which he did with matt damon and jody foster but like of course district nine uh going all the way back movie. to the days when he was in south africa uh, and was capital capitalizing on that we, we went through like a run of sci-fi films um but this conversation is really interesting because he also gets into 
the impact that Chappie had on his career and, and how he had to kind of regroup after that and how he wanted to go into... Um, he also had a number of projects that we get into in this conversation. Like, he had a script for Alien 5. No, wait. I'm not sure yeah. what Alien number it is. is no, it, it, would be, it would be 5 because it was 3, then Resurrection, so it would be 5. And um, I think it had, like, Cameron's Blessing and it was getting pretty far along. I want to yeah, say it Cameron's even... Cameron's Blessing mean these days? ...was going to include Sigourney Weaver. I think it was, like, a Sigourney... I think yeah. she had read it and was behind it, too. Well, and, and Michael he... Bean? I want to say Michael Bean was going to be... Oh, I really? think so, too. And this one felt like... He doesn't elaborate in the conversation, but I thought it was one of the ones where they... Almost like a Terminator type thing where sure. they were going to say, like, this is a sequel to Aliens. Yeah. And the other ones don't exist sure. sort of deal, which would have been interesting. Which is okay. Um, I was like, well, also, then, then you got to come up with an, an excuse as to where Newt is. Yes. But I think she would have been a character. I oh, just think. a different actress. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pro probably. And they just um, made aliens possessive for the third? Aliens, aliens something? He put the aliens apostrophe. apostrophe. <laughs> yeah. It's ownership. Yes. <laughs> um, and then... They um, do take over the ship, you know? Robocop. Uh, he talks about a Robocop uh, sequel that he wrote. So um, anyway, interesting thing. Wow. Neil Blomkamp on, uh, on Real Blend. Uh, sit still and listen to it, for God's sakes. I know I just said we get very technical, but I grew up Catholic. Uh, I still kind of practice, you know, basically. And I'm fascinated with this idea that the Vatican might have special agent priests <laughs> that they yeah. send out. Uh, <laughs> please tell me in your research that you found <laughs> some evidence that this is true. It's so funny. My mom said the exact same thing. My mom watched the film and she was like, Neil, is that true? And I was like, what does that even mean? Is that true? I was like, I know that they have, they do have a course on exorcism at the Vatican. So that's true. But no, I don't think that there's like a black ops unit that is hunting <laughs> demons with like M16s. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I went to a, a school here in, in the States called the Catholic University of America, and it was always rumored that there was a, a book in a tower uh, mm. that they used specifically for exorcisms. And, and I swear to God, most recently uh, this summer, we were visiting family up in the DC area and they had a, a, a parish priest come by for a picnic and a rumored he was going around doing exorcisms. And when I asked him point blank about it, I was like, so tell me about the exorcisms. He just clammed up like he was unable to speak oh, right. and, and couldn't go into yeah. details about it. So I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. I figured you might, you might know. No, I, I, I would have to say that it's probably not true, but I mean, the idea came from, uh, like this is obviously a very small movie, but if you were to make a bigger film in the same world, you could, the, the original idea was this idea where if some mass murderer in history that, you know, like if you take Stalin, for example, okay, maybe someone like Stalin was demonically possessed. Mm -hmm. And, and so these huge events in history that are these these kind of genocidal effects maybe are the result of demonic possession and in order to take down someone at that scale the vatican would have to have a very well financed massive operation that they could go up <laughs> against that 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 kind of person with so that that was the original idea and then um not for a movie but just like a concept and then when we started working on this i just you know i just pulled that off the shelf and mixed it with the uh, simulation stuff that I wanted to do and ended up with demonic. I dig it. You, you, you speak about the simula simulation. Uh, I, I think Sean and I were texting. We're both geeked out about how it looks in the film. There's, it's, it's a very cool look. And it, it gave me vi almost vibes of like digital rotoscoping, like what Linklater did on kind of like Scanner Darkly. And uh, and I was just curious kind of how you achieved it. Uh, it has technology uh, as, has advanced, obviously, over the years. I'm wondering how you achieved the look of it. Did you actually practically film it and then like animate it? I'm, I'm just I'm so interested in how, how you pulled it off. So there's the process that we used is a process called volumetric capture, which is highly um, new and and Ooh. not not fully mature. Uh, and I, I've I've wanted to do something with it. I mean, Oats Studios online. If you guys know, if you guys know or don't know it, it's it's a, like an experimental studio that we have. Um, is a perfect venue to experiment with volumetric capture um, because of its very early glitchy look uh so so something like oats and, and youtube videos you could do that and an experiment and whatever it looks like it, it would look like the problem with the feature is because of the glitchy nature of it you would have to write into the story it would have to be embedded in the narrative like why it looks prototypey and why it looks glitchy mm -hmm. so 
Um, so that's what I ended up doing. But I, I always, you know, for, for about three years or maybe two years, I've been totally obsessed with, with the idea of volumetric capture. And it's in, in computer graphics, there's this idea called photogrammetry, which is right. where, yeah. Picture you like, used that on, on Fight Club, right? When you went, when you went out of the yeah. building and down into the, uh, yeah. into the van, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, fir- the first usages of it was, was around Fight Club and, and the Matrix where what, what they're getting, like if you look at Fight Club as an example, what they're getting from that is no, a modeler doesn't sit and build a van and build a warehouse and build um, explosives in the van. You, it's all just a physical piece of, it's a, it's a set um, or it's a real van in a real garage. But you take billions of photos of it, like just normal, normal photos, and then you feed them to a computer program that extrapolates a three-dimensional model out of them, like a CAD, like a CAD file. Oh my God. And, and it also brings the thing that's different about photogrammetry compared to a CAD file is it brings all of the RGB data, the image data. Like if you had an Avis logo on the side of the van, it would come with it, right? So your your three D object would have that logo. Um, so so that's that's photogrammetry, and it's really good for building sets and stuff in computer graphics. But volumetric capture is if you were to do that twenty four times a second. Oh. So, oh. so this you know is I mean? new. This is so, newer. So Fincher didn't yeah. have this ability. No, no, no. Fight Club. Yeah. No, 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 no. Because it's it's related to motion. So so at twenty four frames per second, every single frame of of Carly in this movie, um, or or Natalie as her mom, are their individual frames. They're almost like individual CAD files with all of their textures, like their hair and and eye color and everything, like as an individual three D object. So. Oh. So it's, it's super, super difficult to manage and wrangle because it's so complicated, but I knew I wanted to use it somewhere. And I also know that it'll, it'll become more prevalent as the resolution increases and you can use it in ways where you don't have to say it's prototype technology, which is what Demonic does with it. Um, but yeah, that's what it is. And it looks exactly, it's not as though, um, like, how do I say this? We knew it would be glitchy going in. So, yeah, huh. so the look, you don't really have that much control over the look. It kind of is what it, it is what it is. Yeah. And then um, we had control over the locations that she was in. So we, we photogrammetry those houses and the, the sanitarium, and then we broke them down to make them crunch down to the same polygonal level that she looks, that, that she's at. Oh. So they look, they look similar. I, 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 if you don't mind me asking, so in, in terms of the actors in those scenes, are, are they captured the same way the, with, with the photogrammetry as well? Is that is that captured that way? I apologize if I'm not following it fully, it's because it, it's so interesting to me. I just remember I remember yeah. Fincher talking about it for Fight Club. Uh, yeah, yeah. This photo, photogrammetry specifically, so, but how are you capturing the actors? Like a performance. So, so, so imagine, yeah. So imagine like if you treat photogrammetry as with one object. So just imagine a shoebox. Okay, it's like. That, that's an easy thing. So there's a there's a cubic shoebox. You walk around it with a still camera and shoot a hundred photos. Give it to the computer. It gives you back a 3D object of a shoebox with the textures on it. Right. Right. So now imagine if you took instead of a hundred cameras, we had 260 cameras that were 4K cameras. Okay. <laughs> and then and then you build you build a like a cage like a scaffold lattice that is very um, claustrophobic and very close to the actor because the closer the better the resolution so um imagine imagine a cylinder um like a you know like a cylinder of of uh of scaffolding caked with cameras and cameras overhead um and the actors are in that four meter across diameter cylinder that's the space that they had now what happens is those 4k cameras all 260 of them are running at 24 frames a second. So if you pause any second, if you pause one frame, you can send 260 angles of your one actor to be computed into a 3D object, the same as the shoebox. The only, the only difference is that you're doing it over, you, you're, gather, you're essentially ga- gathering motion because you're doing it over the course of 24 um, times a second for as many like stop motion almost i kind of in a way you're kind of gathering the actor as though they were a stop motion puppet sort of you know you're you're (laughs) photograph you're photographing them um so so it's wildly different from motion capture it has nothing to do with motion capture although on the surface it seems kind of similar they're they're totally different processes wow that's amazing dude you just blew my mind (laughs) i i I will never forget you because you're mentioning the cameras I'll never forget seeing some of the Matrix behind the scene footage where they had that like volume where it was like a like a bunch of cameras in a circle that would capture. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just 
it's the technology advancements. It's, is that is was that similar at all to what you're doing? Um, not exactly. It's it's sort of like it's in the same ballpark, but it's not exactly mm-hmm. the same. What what they were doing there was that was bullet time, right? And it was um, all of the all of the cameras represented where the virtual camera would be as it spun around Keanu. So you you could fire all of those cameras to fire <laughs> at the exact same moment. Or you could delay them with a millisecond, which would create the sensation of movement. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, what 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 uh, what the Wachowskis were doing in 1999 was pretty amazing back then. So. <laughs> yeah, wow. when you think about it, how cutting. Well, thank edge you this, for answering that. Wow, point. that's insane. I can't believe we're a few months away from seeing Lana do it again. Essentially, yeah. at this point, with uh, I can't we even see a trailer for that movie, which is kind yeah, of I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about that. I am too. Um, so in this film, you send your character into the simulation, and she ends up being in, in a particularly disturbing uh, memory. And I was kind of fascinated by that because I I wanted to ask. I'm more of an optimist. I would love to know if you could step into the simulation and take it to your happiest memory, Neil. Where where would it bring you to? <laughs> Oh, like a like a hypothetical happiest happiest moment or something. For you, sure, yeah, for you. Jesus, man, no, that's like deep. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I don't don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to go there. It's like, yeah, let me. I'm gonna. I'll just. I. I. I'd I'd go somewhere else. I'd go somewhere a little bit darker, maybe. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Neil, I was wondering this in the trailer, and this is. I know this is a marketing thing, so I, I'm assuming you had nothing to do with this, but when they market a trailer from a filmmaker that has made so many great films, and I've, I've been following your work, obviously, since District 9, um, I was interested to know, they choose, they say, from the director of District mm-hmm. 9 and Elysium. Yeah. Um, but what is the choice not to use Chappie? Or uh, how, how does that, do you think those two films more fit what this movie represents? Because it's so different, but I wonder, like, what do, what do you think about that? Uh, it's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, I the first cut of the trailer had no credits um, because I would rather have no credits. You know, um, it would just be like this is the movie, uh, and then um, and then they specifically asked to put credits in, and I think the ones that they put forward were those films, which means that um, that I think Chappie is tonally too unusual and weird to like, if you're trying to sell a horror film and you say Chappie, I think it just melts people's brain. I think Chappie, uh, Chappie melts people's brains regardless of whether you're selling another film or not. <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 w- once credits are in there at all, I just, I don't really care because I don't, I, I would rather, I would rather them not be there. But, um, but I mean, you know, filmmaking is an economic thing it's it's uh it's fueled by by economics so they have they have to they have to um make an attempt at getting people to watch the film and if there's something about those other films in in the realm of science fiction that is applicable to this film then i guess it makes sense to them but yeah i i would uh i would not do that um if it were up to me i would just have no credits well it's funny like in the in the new suicide squad trailer they say from the horribly beautiful mind of james gunn i mean this is a I mean, it's a marketing thing. It's like, you're so right. Yeah. It's an economic thing. But I, I, I always feel like the filmmakers probably don't love those <laughs> things sometimes. I wonder. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be interesting to speak to, to James and find out like how he feels about that. I asked him and he said, what, he, what he, he, say? he said he was flattered by it, but he wasn't his idea. <laughs> so yeah. That's what he said. So yeah. he, was, he thought it was cool, but it wasn't his idea at all. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, um, one of the things that we've been doing over the course of this past year and a half is having filmmakers on the show and, and getting their perspective of staying creative during you know obviously a very difficult time there's been plenty of people who just wanted to you know turn off uh that that portion of their their brain and 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 stay in the in the now and there's others like yourself who who took this time to get creative and so i just i was wondering about your approach to you know at a time when we all had to sort of shut down and and stay isolated where did this need to to create and write and 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 remain active come from um (laughs) It's an interesting question. I think it was so it was so early on in the process of COVID. It was, when when we were doing it, um, things like quarantining, quarantine, and isolation and stuff weren't. It was so early that that nothing really had been locked down. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was less a case of 
what was coming, which we didn't know about, and more a case of um, that the, the film industry was on pause until they knew what the situation was. Mm-hmm. So, so what I was, what I just wanted to keep shooting and you know just attempting to be creative, and it really was born out of that. I think we, it wouldn't have been possible to make it once actual restrictions were put in place. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing that's weird about the movie, especially for the fact that it's such a low budget film. Um, it had like nine months of visual effects, which is hilarious. It, it shouldn't wow. have, you know, that shouldn't have happened. So we shot so early uh, that that many of the films that shot after us during COVID have already come out. Um, do you know what I mean? So, so there's, it really was so early on that there wasn't really, um, uh, like the protocols that we were following were sometimes being contradicted by different unions and there were different points of view about how things should happen. Like the, now, obviously it's just, totally um established mm-hmm. yeah. you knew you knew it was gonna have that long of a visual effects uh like post-production time i would assume right yeah i think i mean i sort of knew um i don't think we knew exactly how long it would be but uh but yeah you're right that like we knew going into it that there would be you know extensive amounts of work to get the volume capture to be turned into the simulation mm-hmm. yeah. yeah neil i've always found it incredibly fascinating i know you've spoken on this on, the, on this a million times about the improvisation that was used in district nine between jason cope and charlto copley um and yeah. I, I i would love just to hear your thoughts on it years later kind of looking back on it and kind of what that meant to you as a filmmaker to experience the filmmaking like that and kind of how the improvisation of that kind of came about on that set and kind of fast forwarding to demonic has has any of that played out out in terms of you as a filmmaker now like the, the lessons you learned on district nine but before you answer that i'm just interested to just tell our audience because i don't know if a lot of people will really really know that a lot of that is improvised in district nine and shout out to jason cope obviously who's brilliant uh in that film as well and i just wanted to ask about that perspective yeah i mean that movie was uh was crazy to shoot because of that. Um, you know, it was district nine is very difficult to, to shoot for a, a host of different reasons, but there is, yeah. there's an added level of, um, of like brain brain usage that's required when, when improv is being thrown around like that, like it's much more chaotic and, and unstructured. So what, first of all, obviously it wouldn't work unless you had actors that were, as talented as those actors are and, and as, as, as able to think on their feet as they are. And the other component was having um, in the writing and a very, very uh, clear arc and, and, and like a, a character that really changed over the course of the film and something that was unmistakably easy to hang on to. Mm. Um, it would be more difficult if it was more nuanced. So the process was um, we had we had various versions of scripts that Terry and I had written, and then we had um, we had other documents and like we had this this structure of the story. And then in the morning, I would talk through primarily with Shalto and also with Jason. I would talk through like the meaning of the scene is this. It's meant to convey this, so we know that we, this has to come across. Okay. And, and then we'd all agree and it would be like, that's what, that's what has to come across. Then you would do the first improv and it would be like quite just crazy and like all over the place, but there'd be nuggets of awesome stuff and it would always be too long. So then the next thing is like, it's too long, but these nuggets are super cool. And the next one is like more in the zone. And then usually the third time you do it, you're like really, really, really in the zone. Mm. And then sometimes um, I think Shaw would actually say the lines that were scripted um, in case we needed them, um, which was, you know, sometimes a more, condensed like succinct way of, of saying it but generally it was his crazy genius that brought that brought all of it to life um and jason's super good at, at, at it as well um and in relation to demonic it's funny because demonic is almost the most structured and controlled thing i've ever done except for some of the oat stuff like firebase or raka it's uh mm. You know, there's very little improv. It's super structured, and that was all on purpose because I wanted the I wanted I wanted it to feel unsettling, and like like that there was tension that was there the whole time. And I think that the way to get that is is with everything being structured in how you approach it, so that it it feels very sure handed to the audience. That okay, I know I'm meant to be seeing this, but like, why am I seeing this? You know, why why is it sunny but there's this ominous music? Like, what does that mean? Mm. Um, so it's, yeah, it's very, uh, very controlled compared to the other films that I've made. 
Well, yeah, and, and Jason was on stilts during during all that improv too, which is wild. Uh, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't remember if there's like extra stuff that we released or not, but the whole eviction scene is so funny with him. I mean, because obviously we shot way more than what is in the movie, and uh, the stuff that he's doing when he's getting evicted because he plays an entire community of prawns. He he plays yeah. all of the prawns. Uh, you know, it's just so funny. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, Neil, I'm glad you brought up the idea that that demonic is far more structured than what you've worked on before, because I think prior to uh, the three features, the feature length films you've made have had like the emphasis has kind of landed on some of the tech, you know, and some of the um, the visual effects that you've used uh, to create them. Whereas I thought this one was really character driven. And I, I, I kind of yeah. felt that you were writing a lot more dialogue. Uh, you know, I was caught up in the in the conversations that the characters were, were using to push the narrative forward. Did you feel like you were writing more dialogue than you ever have for a feature and what was it like sort of flexing that muscle yeah i mean what what i was what i was consciously going for was something that felt very intimate and very um very centric around carly you know that mm -hmm. that was that was the goal so I, I i knew totally that 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 was the goal but but it was it was supplemented by this idea of of dread of tension the whole time and so yeah there's no question that i think I think that um, you know it's it's good to just kind of focus on 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 the bare the bare basics of filmmaking, which is which is just character and story, and then uh, in in this case, this kind of you know dark brooding tone as well, and and that's that's really it was an exercise in that. You know, Neil, I, I, I found this so interesting because you, if you look at people's filmographies, whether it be an actor or a filmmaker, there, there are times where you see breaks in between films that they do. And it could be years. And I know that Chappie was 2015, if I remember correctly. And then yeah. basically we're six years later with your next feature. I know you made a bunch of short films in between. Um, yeah. So just in, just curious kind of why, the, why, why this is the first feature uh, of yours in six years. I know you were making those shorts, um, but was it a creative choice? Uh, were, there th were there films you were trying to get off the ground that maybe didn't get made? I know Alien is a big topic of discussion and films like that, but I just wonder kind of what happened in those six years and why you felt Demonic was a good return feature. Well, I mean, uh, Demonic, Demonic really did come about because of the pandemic. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. like this, this, this idea of wanting to self-finance a small horror film that we could just go out and shoot is exactly what happened. You know, it, it was like, right. it, it wouldn't, it literally wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the pandemic. But um, so you wouldn't, you might not have had another feature at this point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like wow. who, know, who knows when the next one, you know, who knows? But I think, I, I don't think I was consciously going like, I'm going to take six years off. I mean, what I was consciously building oats, that was, that was uh, where my, my main focus was. And then, like you said, um, alien did, uh, you know, alien five didn't happen. So that was, that was time spent on a film that didn't happen. But I think regardless of whether it was conscious or not, I needed to go and uh, just reset and just think for a bit. And which is what I did. Mm, I, yeah. I mean, this, this is an unusual film to come back with, right? Like a smaller, low yeah. budget, weird horror film. Um, but it's, it's, it's just the way that things played out. Yeah. yeah. It is and it isn't. You know, everybody's experimenting lately, you know, yeah. and, and just going with the stories that move them. And so clearly this story moved you in this moment. I'm really glad you got the opportunity to, to tell it and to come back yeah. with it. Um, you know, I, it played in Berlin. Is that correct? It was at the Berlin Film Festival? I don't think that it, I don't know if it played there. I'm not sure. Oh, really? <laughs> I think, uh, I think a, a lot of foreign sales happened there, um, but I don't know if the film played there because okay. I, I don't think we had a cut of it. There was, I, I need to double check that. Gotcha. Well, just because yeah. it felt like, especially with IFC picking it up, it feels like the type of film that would get great exposure in a Midnight Madness type uh, programming and you know with the return of festivals kind of coming around the corner I wanted yeah. to get your input on the importance of of a festival and getting a movie like this in front of an audience you know it, it might not have huge star power you know but it's a story that you are very passionate about and and the how festivals can help a, a title like this succeed I, I really hope audiences um, see how talented Carly is though I think I think that they're gonna really well hopefully they they enjoy her performance in it because i think she did she did a super good job um but but you know in terms of festivals i think um 
I don't really have that much experience with them in the way that films for me have happened before. Mm. Uh, but all of a sudden I have, I have a, a bunch of invites to festivals for this movie that I'm stoked to go to. So that's great. Yeah. So I'm uh, I, I've always been into the, the idea of festivals. It just, I've just never gone through it in a way that a lot of independent filmmakers do. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited to, to, to go through that process and just, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's off to the fact now in a way, uh, but it's still, the experience is still similar. It's very cool. Yeah. Neil, you said something just now that really emotionally, I, I, I have to ask you about this because I'm very fascinated by it. Obviously, I know you talked at length about Alien and, and the film not, not getting made, but just hearing you say that, like we put a lot of work into it and it didn't pan out. It just, I, it makes me emotionally feel for you because I, I would imagine a lot of work went into that um, I was just curious about like, you know, what work actually went into it specifically, how far you got with it. I mean, I, I know that we've seen some uh, some of the images come out and some of the ideas come out recently. Um, but, you know, in terms of like all the work you put in for it, is it possible that maybe with the Disney Fox merger that maybe someone will pick it up on that end? Like, I'm just curious where where your head is on that. I mean, I don't really have anything to do with it, so I don't, I don't know what future it may have. It wouldn't, it wouldn't involve me. The work, the primary work that was put in was the script, right? I mean, if if you're, it, it takes a year to write to write a script, um, like of that kind of movie, and uh, so that was that was a lot of that was the primary work really was the script work. Um, uh, but but it's also everything else too. It's just like you start bending your life around that because this is yeah. this will be your your focus. So, um, but it wasn't. Oh. We always make a, a, a we have an internal joke essentially when we're trying to get a filmmaker, you know, that, we, that we're super anxious to speak with. And we always joke if it happens, because literally nothing is done in this industry yeah. until it's yeah. finished and in the yeah. can and recorded. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have to have that mindset as a, as a filmmaker also? Yeah. Yeah, I know for sure. For sure. It's like, it's, it's like, it's not the film, the film isn't out or hasn't come out or isn't getting made until it's like in a, in a theater, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It could get yeah, it, 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 Everything could be like ambushed at any point. You know? <laughs> could, essentially anything could happen. I mean, didn't district nine basically come out of a, of a halo film not being made essentially. It didn't kind yeah. of come out of that concept. And Peter Jackson just gave you what 30 million to go make that movie basically. I didn't come out of the concept of, of halo. It came out of the fact that because halo died. Right. Um, uh, Fran and Peter were like, what do you want to do? Because you're here, uh, you know, and Weta, Weta's, Weta's here and like every, everything is, is kind of set up. So what, what do you want to do? And I done a, I done a short film called the live in Joburg, which was one yeah, of the I've things, seen it. Amazing. Yeah. That was one of the things that they, that they'd seen that led to Halo. So, um, so I think in the same day, you know, it was really, it was really Fran and Pete that were like, you should, you should make this. <laughs> and, uh, and then what happened was we spent a year developing it similar, similarly to what I just said happened with Alien. And then, um, and then uh, QED financed it and it was sold to Sony for the English speaking world and uh, you know, a few other territories and stuff. So it, it, it was lucky, like it gained momentum quickly. I mean, all elements of that film are, ridiculous like first time yeah. director all improv director's friend is the lead actor <laughs> science fiction set in south africa like all elements don't add up like the chance of that happening is very low so it's it's uh it's i really am you know massively grateful to peter and fran for how that played out it just there's no there's literally no other way it could have happened that's a masterpiece to come out the gate with a film like that i think it was nominated for best picture does that i mean that pressure going into your next films must have been insane for you. You know, I, I feel like either I don't spend enough time thinking about that or thinking about myself or something, but like those people always ask me this kind of question and it doesn't register as much. I think, I think when filmmakers like, I wouldn't have made Chappie, I suppose, if that was how I was thinking, right? Like if you want to, if you just want to, um, yeah, I think I think what I'm trying to say is you could get safer and safer by being mm. more and more scared, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so so the best thing to do is like just just don't do that. Just continue to make stuff. Some some of it will will not work, and some of it will work, and that's the nature of projects that are slightly unusual. So I mean, as unusual as District Nine is to have to have you know. Uh, like two South African rappers in a $50 million film about a robot is, is equally fucking insane. So, uh, yeah. 
well, so good. We have about one minute left. And so I just have to ask, are you actually planning on going back into that world? We keep hearing about District 10. Yeah, it's for sure. Eventually. I mean, there's no there's no immediate plans right now other than writing the screenplay. But um, but yes, totally. I, I love the concept for the screenplay. Um, yeah, definitely. I, and, you know, yeah. And Sean wants to see your RoboCop Returns movie if that ever if that if that ever happens. Well, I would love to see what happened with that. I just can't imagine getting to create in that sandbox. Yeah, I know. That's it's such a cool world. I'm such a fan of, of Verhoeven. He's a wild filmmaker, you know, he's still to this day. The things that he's yeah. putting out are so unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, Neil, listen, we, we thank can't you. thank you enough for stopping by and, and spending time with us. And uh, we're going to tell everybody to go check out Demonic and um, and really continued success. Man, hope, hope we get you back on the show sometime soon. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much to Neil Blomkamp for joining the show. Uh, his film Demonic is coming out in limited release this Friday. So make sure you check your listings before heading out to check it out. Speaking of going to the theaters, uh, the talking points this week is going to be all about Free Guy. And the fact that its box office was $28 million domestically, which many people in the industry uh, heralded as a massive surprise and a huge win for original IP. And, you know, Ryan Reynolds in particular was extremely vocal on social media about thanking people for coming out to support this film that they had put all their love into. Yeah. And, and truthfully, you know, Gabe, you were joking often about... <clears throat> how many trailers we've been seeing for this and how long it feels sure. like they've been advertising free guy. But you know, when you take it from the perspective of, of Reynolds and Sean Levy, who was on the show, like they've been sitting on this film for a really long time and then they're putting it out into the uncertainty of how is it going to do? And the fact that it didn't have a home video streaming element to compete with, even though it's a, it's a Fox Disney type thing and could have been put on Disney plus, I suppose. Um, so Gabe, you had a point about the fact that it's 28 million domestic isn't necessarily as impressive to you as as it might have been to other people. Um, I, it's not that that's not impressive. I think it is, and I, I especially since it was projected, I think around twenty or like the low twenty. I saw like what, fifteen to twenty. Is a yeah, project, yeah. So it myself. wasn't like, and who knows what's influencing that? Like Suicide Squad's performance might have pulled that down a little bit for whoever was kind of making that call. For me, the issue was a lot of people, and maybe that's just the headline usage. Um, we're comparing it to Suicide Squad and sort of being like, oh, it demolished Suicide Squad when Suicide Squad opened to 26 million versus 28 and it was a day and date release. And I felt like mm -hmm. the the messaging about what this film's success versus the other films appeared failure um, was a little bit heavy handed in, in the coverage of it. But or that the knives were a little bit out for James Gunn and for Suicide James Squad? Gunn or, or yeah, it, it, whatever that motivation is of just like wanting to get a, a superhero movie in your headline or yeah. Um, because the the news cycle was the disappointment of Suicide Squad, and that's kind of, at this point, um, a trained response for DC mm. audiences to get some sort of negative spin from, from sort of DC coverage. I don't, I don't necessarily know what the motivation was. Maybe that's going too far, but it, was, it just felt a little too heavy-handed when I think that this film did really well, considering, um, and I think the other film was under a different set of circumstances. Yeah, so. I don't. I was blown away, and Jake, I don't know how you feel about this because I really put it in that twelve to fifteen million dollar range going into the weekend, and I just didn't know if it was the concerns of people going back to the theaters. You know, it's, it felt like that was getting louder. Um, and yes, the idea that it's an it's an original IP, and while Ryan Reynolds wanted to celebrate the fact that they were rolling one out, those don't always do great. Yeah. Like people do invest in franchises and characters that they are familiar with. So um, I was really impressed with twenty eight million. Where were you at? Were you really surprised? Yeah, I was. If only because I felt like no one was really talking to me about it. No one mm. was asking. You know, I can usually sort of gauge. Um, which is also kind of sometimes how I felt about Suicide Squad. I didn't have as many people talking to me about Suicide Squad as, as there should have been for a movie of that magnitude. Um, you know, it's so hard to judge like a movie's box office right now. Like we don't really know what movies are capable of. What I am, what I do think is going to be interesting is in two weeks or three weeks uh, when Shang Chi opens, mm -hmm. um, because if that opens, let let's say that in two weeks that opens to sixty million then we will know that a movie is capable of doing that. Like mm -hmm. comparing it even to Black Widow a couple of months ago or A Quiet Place. I mean, as weird as it sounds, like May was a different world ago. May yeah, was, world. was completely different circumstances. So you can't say, well, this movie did poorly because Black Widow opened to 70 X number of weeks ago. It doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. What I do, what I do think will be interesting is I think we'll have a better grasp on a movie's box office if one does all of a sudden randomly well right now. So I think if Shang-Chi does open to 60 million, 50 million, 60 million, 
in two weeks. I think that will give me a little bit more perspective on how well or not well Suicide Squad and, and Free Guy did, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Yeah, and Shang-Chi won't have Disney+. Yeah. Plus. Like right yeah, now, exactly. until they make a decision. I think I read today that Feige wouldn't commit on Eternals, whether Eternals is going to have that premiere access mm-hmm. element. Too hard they, to know that far ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're did trying to just you guys have someone on the red carpet last night? Uh, Eric Eisenberg went, but we didn't necessarily cover press. He just went to the premiere. Um, so, so you guys got, just gave up on, on working? You're just going <laughs> to... Yeah, yeah comple- completely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well... No. One um, <laughs> with the with the the free guy and and uh, Shang Chi, one thing I thought was interesting. I think a Variety had a write up about this um, about the demographic of Free Guy was mostly single men like over the age of eighteen. Hmm. Um, and the angle they kind of took on it was how uh, that wasn't a huge win for theaters because they don't. That's not a demographic that typically buys concessions. But with that in mind, with this oh, going, that's interesting. With, with, yeah, I thought that was an interesting. It was an interesting piece. Um, with that in mind, though, I think it's interesting to see how demographics are going to play a, a more heavy hand in some of these. Because thinking about Shang Chi, you know, if, if right now single people who are just going to go by themselves can make that decision for themselves and feel safe to go, are the ones who are really making the return, and families mm-hmm. aren't. Well, then a four quadrant, you know, superhero movie might not have that same sort of bounce back to theaters if, if families are still, you know, keeping their kids safe at home. Sure. They're sending them back to school. So maybe, uh, Sean, maybe you know more about this than I. You know, maybe families out there are are trying to limit the amount of exposure kids get because they're trying to keep them, you know, in school and not have some sort of outbreak issue. Or, or Because I know after a year, people are very excited to send kids back to school and not I home. do not. And this this will lead us into this week in movies. <clears throat> if I had a family... Uh, movie right now, I would put it to streaming as quickly as possible. Yeah, because families are not letting uh, their kids go. That to just theaters. happened with Hotel Transylvania Four. Yes, it yeah. did. Go yeah. to Amazon. Hundred mil. So Paramount is bringing out uh, Paw Patrol. And listen, none of us saw Paw Patrol, but obviously it's a movie that's going to be going heavy at uh, families with really young kids. And I just don't think no. I mean, the 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 word around families is that it, you can't vaccinate your youngest kid right so at least surround them with people who have the vaccine you know get everybody in your house who is capable of getting it to be like that buffer zone so no with kids going back to school and they are starting this week um you wouldn't want to take on the added risk of, of any kind of activity because you want to reserve it for activities that you want them to be able to do which is like a, t- a team sport or some type of you know club or organization at the school or just school itself because you don't want them to get to the place where they have to quarantine at home for two weeks or or do virtual you know all these kids are chomping at the bit to get back uh to their classrooms and be around their friends that yeah going to the theaters for paw patrol does not seem like i i don't i don't think that movie's gonna do it. i hate it for paramount because I know that they're really trying to get um, their slate back up and running, essentially. And Snake Eyes had a hard time getting off the ground. And, you know, they're holding steady until Top Gun, essentially, uh, to sort of come in and rescue them. But Paw Patrol is not going to do it. So Have they uh, said for um, for Top Gun, have they mentioned at all about how quickly it's going to come to VOD or how quickly it's going to go to Paramount Plus? Have they mentioned anything? I think that? right now they're probably trying to decide if it's even going to come to theaters this year. Oh, That's... well, oh, you mean like delay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they would definitely delay it before they vod that could could you they i first off i don't think cruz would let them vod it i mean those two big ones top gun and bond you know if either of them blinks again that's a that's just going to be a huge ripple through the industry yeah Uh, because next next summer it's pretty set right that would just change so much right you'll end up getting bond on like the last weekend in january Oh, a birthday movie! Where a Bond movie should be. Yeah. Uh, let's get to The Protégé, uh, which is coming from Lionsgate, starring Michael Keaton and Maggie Q. Uh, Jake, yeah. you saw that. How was it? I did. I actually ended up seeing it after the junkie because I didn't have time to watch it before the interviews. And, and I heard actually some decent things, so I made a point to go back and and watch it. Um, you know, I actually surprisingly really liked it. I mean, granted, it's, it's a really kind of fun and sometimes different twist on a movie that we've seen kind of before. You know, Maggie Q plays kind of this badass assassin who was kind of uh, sort of brought up by uh, Samuel Jackson's character. Samuel Jackson ends up uh, uh, being killed. Uh, it's not a spoiler. It's in the trailer. Um, and uh, and then she kind of ends up going on this revenge mission. She ends up... The, the character, without giving too much away about Michael Keaton, is not quite who you think he's going to be. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those movies, it's like, yes, I feel like I've seen it before, but, like, almost every beat was, like, tweaked enough to kind of keep my interest to make me go, okay, well, you're not, you're not necessarily coloring within the lines, like, you're still mm. tweaking this enough to keep my interest, and, and, yeah, maybe it falls under the umbrella of, like, okay, sort of the revenge mission, um, after you kill a mentor kind of thing, but for the most part, it, and, and, and Maggie Q's is just an overall badass, and, and, and she very much holds her own, and, and, uh, you know, I really liked sort of all the random choices Michael Keaton is making. You know, we, we, uh, when we got Michael Keaton, um, we had to split our time between two different films because he has two vastly different films. He has another one coming out that we'll talk about at the end of this month called Worth, which is a, a post 9-11 film. So just, just within that day was a testament to sort of the, all the wild and crazy choices that he's making mm-hmm. while f- coming back as Bruce Wayne. Um, so yeah, I actually was, was very pleasantly surprised. I, it's not one that I'd necessarily say in the middle of everything, like, oh my God, rush out and go see it. But I think if it popped up on, on, on PVOD and you, you know, rented it, I think you'd be very pleasantly surprised by it. The director is Martin Campbell, isn't he? Yeah, Martin Campbell. Yeah. Who's made a number of tremendous films. Over yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> directed two Bonds. Yeah. Uh, and the, the first. Two really each, good ones. Yeah. I, I asked him because he directed Pierce Brosnan's first Bond and Daniel mm-hmm. Craig's first Bond. So I asked him if he were, if he were to direct the first bond for the next guy. Ah, oh, good um, question. Um, and basically I was asked him like, how would he reinvent it? And he basically, he said, there is no reinvention of this. He said, basically he said with Craig, there's no going back. He said, you can't give an audience this brutal realistic of James Bond and then expect us to go back to the, oh. the days of Connery and all that. Like, Interesting. So, so I thought, That's you know. true. Huh? Yeah. I wish Craig got better movies in the Why? He got Craig got great movies. They're great. Even mm. even his lesser movie, even like Spectre and Quantum of Solace, were better than most of what Pierce Brosnan I really liked got. Spectre. I didn't dislike it as much as yeah. everyone else did. I think coming off of Skyfall, like it Skyfall was, is much better. Skyfall, Sky, I mean, like, Skyfall is arguably the best Bond movie. I was going to say, Bond, is that the best, best Bond, best movie? modern yeah. Bond movie? It's definitely up there. Um, I tried to rewatch Quantum somewhat recently. I did rewatch Spectre, um, and it was you're right, better than I remembered yeah. it to be, but still not. It feels like he has two sets of part ones and part twos. Yeah. Like Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace feel like almost the same movie split in two. To the point where yeah, Quantum yeah, of Solace yeah. picks up exactly where... Right. And even Spectre and, and, and um, Skyfall, and Skyfall and Spectre almost feel like a part one, part two. They do. Um, sort of thing. So and then, so it's going to be interesting. It feels like he's getting part one, part two, part one, part two, and then kind of... Part sort three? Of the, and then the epilogue. You know, the, <laughs> yeah. the, what, what, uh, what Coppola calls the coda. Yeah. which is uh, of, of the story. Oh, that, thank you for mentioning that um, because I finally got to see Coda. Oh, yeah. God damn, is that a great movie. <laughs> uh, Godfather movie. 3? No, Coda. Oh. Coda. The actual <laughs> <No>. film Coda. <laughs> the actual uh, film Coda. I, I thought you were talking about because his new his new 3 was... Yeah, yeah, was yeah. Good. yeah. Okay, dude, no. I told you. I told you Coda. I told you. Didn't I tell you? It's so wonderful. And then you were like, oh, Jake, you're so smudgy. No, no, no. Everybody was talking about how great it was, but I only listened to you, honestly. Yeah. It was your recommendation. Um, you know, it's on Apple Plus. If you if you happen to subscribe to it, please watch it. It's tremendous. Um, I don't want to even get into any of the details of the plot, but it's it's as heartwarming and uplifting and inspirational as anything I've seen in a in a very very long time. Um, unlike uh, Demonic, and with all due respect to Neil Blomkamp. Uh, his new movie is not very good. It's interesting from this perspective. Um, and as you heard him talk about in the interview, that filmmaking process that they do in order to put the main character uh, into this virtual reality set. So it's about, um, it's it's an unsolved murder and it's a, a character who is going into a, a form of virtual reality that impl- implants her into memories. I think that might actually bring up reminiscence, which you're uh, going to talk about next too. Um, and the, the way that they use the, it, 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 it creates this sort of like max headroom um unfinished vr type uh that's supposed to be mood setting and it ends up just kind of not working but if the way that he describes it in the interview is that the technology just isn't there yet right and so it really takes you out of the film and it's supposed to be um this sort of immersive demonic possession story and it just never never really hooked me um and so you know we were having this conversation of whether you know is he gonna find a movie that returns him back to uh the form of district nine and it listen it hasn't happened yet although like you you said you like elysium more than i more yeah, than I, I like elysium more than most but i don't think he's ever matched the potential that he showed in district nine which is why the question i asked before we started filming is is he uh, a one-hit wonder yeah 
I mean, I don't know. Look, it only takes one more film, uh, really. Uh, yeah, but how many more chances does he get before? Well, how many? Officially... How many chances has he really had, though? Like you like Elysium, and then Chappie, and then Chappie was the one that sort Chappie of was universally. Him. Yeah, but since then, like this is not a major movie or a major release, and it looks from some of the stuff we saw, like it looks like it was. It's very independent. Yes. Um. And I think he had to do that. Like, I think he had exactly. to take an affordable project. Exactly. Because so, he's not getting bankrolled. Not that that doesn't mean you can't make a good story, but like, uh, talking about, in, in reference to saying like, how many more shots does he get? I don't necessarily know that he's had another like, genuine shot. Yeah. Since Chappie, right? No. No, no, no. He had, well, because he was working on that alien script, and right. then he was working on the, the um, Total Recall script. No, not Total Recall. Robocop. If he comes out with Alien 4 and we love it, yeah. Or five. five. Well, whatever it is. Yes. Um, and we love it. You know, it's a different conversation. For sure. And that it's has a lot, that. like, there's a lot that we would, because it's an established property that we could come into it with, that, that we could end up loving it as much as he does, you know? Sure. Possibly. All right. What is Reminiscence? Because I've heard bits and pieces and I can't quite figure out what's going on. Reminiscence is kind of, it's an old school kind of film noir, but it's set in the future. Very much the, you know, Dane walks into a room you know, the, the, the voiceover from like, you know, the, you know, it almost feels like it should be set in black and white, you know, in the 1940s with smoke everywhere, but it's in color and set in the future where like the, the waters are rising and there's water. Everywhere. Good pitch. I like that. It's a great pitch. And it's, and it's a great premise. The premise is that in the future, uh, we're, you know, the future is so miserable that we're all stuck in nostalgia. We're stuck in the past and there are machines that you can lay down in and you can relive your favorite memory, whether it's go play with a dog that passed away 30 years ago or that moment you met the love of your life that got away. You can relive that over and over again. It's almost like a drug for people. People become addicted to it. The past is kind of a business. And uh, without getting too much, you know, he ends up meeting Rebecca Ferguson. Hugh Jackman ends up meeting Rebecca Ferguson. They fall in love. And all of a sudden, one day, she just disappears. Like, mm. she ghosts him. And so he kind of starts like he, he goes off the rails and starts reliving the moment over and over again where they met and then starts kind of noticing things. And he kind of use try to uses that to start sort of doing the detective gumshoe. Sounds thing, great. Which, you know, it is the premise. What it sounds like. <laughs> OK, it's it's a frustrating movie for me because it is a really great idea. And there are some really cool ideas presented, which is usually the biggest hurdle to get over. Mm -hmm. And I really love the ending i love the resolution on paper like like if this had been a book it'd be an amazing book i think the problem falls at the feet of director lisa joy and mm -hmm. this is like her first major feature and it's a big first feature for her she's the co-creator of westworld i'm just not sure she was the right choice for this um it's it's frustrating because there are so many things on like i can see why so many great actors, you know, it's, it's Tandy Way Newton and, and Rebecca Ferguson and, and, uh, and, and Hugh Jackman. I could see why so many great actors signed on to it because on paper it sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so frustrating because I think had it, it listed a better director, we could have really had something special here. Hmm. Um, I just don't think, and that's not to knock Lisa Joy. It's not to say that she can't be a great director. I just think that this is too big of a movie to try to, I mean, her really only her only other directing credit, I think, was one episode of Westworld. Okay, um, which is not saying that that's a small feat because if you're familiar with that show, you know it's not. But I just think this is too much, too fast. And you know, the thought of like had Nolan directed this, my mm. God, like the, what what we could have gotten out of this. Right. Um, and uh, it's so so it's not so much a, a movie I dislike as a movie that just just really kind of bums me out because it, like greatness is just right there and i just feel like had, had had someone else maybe a little bit more competent directed it we would have had really a really great movie here is the cast really good because they're all good actors yeah i mean everyone's everyone does great work with what they're presented and, and everyone sort of as the as the kids say gets the assignments everyone sort of gets okay. this whole the whole i mean everyone plays it as if they were kind of in <laughs> a 1940s you know noir gumshoe movie yeah um because so, Jackman and Ferguson, you've got me right there. Oh, like, sure. Yeah. I mean, like, that's fantastic. Uh, short of them breaking out in a song and dance, greatest showman style. Yes. Uh, you know, this is a great, it's a great. You pair. just said you hate the beginning of Temple of Doom. You can't just true. throw that in there. You just Very said you true. hate it. It's true. That doesn't mean I'm not allowed to like any musical. I like, I just don't like Does. that one. Just Jake, blankets. anything goes. Anything goes. Except not apparently for good openings. <laughs> not for Jake. Uh, all right. The other thing opening this week is the Nighthouse. I night like house. the nuke the fridge better than anything goes. 
Ew, God no. Insane. No, you the fridge. don't. No, you don't. The fridge it, better than anything goes. It goes. Oh, it goes. Right. The 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 boulder and the the fertility idol, and then it goes flashback, young Indy, and then it goes. Oh, young uh, Indy's great. Young Indy's great. Indy's great. And then it goes. Um, <laughs> Temple and then of Doom. it goes. No, nuke the fridge, and then Temple of Doom. That's insane. That is You're so in. not correct. Wait, I just don't wait. get what you don't like about it. It's so cheesy. Nuke the, the fridge isn't even or the whole like opening like with at the table. Oh, where the table's rolling and they're in Club Obi Wan. They're in Club Obi Wan. For God's okay. sake, I don't even like that. Uh, get out of your own head. No, I'm saying like you would think that that would sell me. Yeah. No, because it's distracting. No, there's uh, you can see C three PO and R two D two and Raiders. It's terrific with the antidote getting kicked around the dance floor. Oh, it's amazing. I hate that. And they oh, spill all the ice. It's terrific. No, it's, it's a great introduction. I, I, I genuinely like. If you guys do a hey, we're gonna tweet along Temple of Doom. I'll just be like, no, I'm good. To quote the Noted. great Jake Hamilton, "Who hurt you? Who hurt you? Who hurt you?" Anyway, Sean, Who when are we getting Harrison Ford? Uh, next week. <laughs> oh yeah, so, I can't. <laughs> it's you know your, what? You were busy. Sorry, you said you were busy. <laughs> you, you know what? Can't wait to listen. Send you know what? I would, tr- I would trade big money to go to the Indy Five set. Can you imagine getting to go to that set? Ugh, that'd be amazing. Would you rather go to the Indy Five set or the No Way Home set? Oh, No Way Home. Not even close. Yeah. But yeah, you went to close. Far From Home set. And Homecoming. Oh, wow. I did. Yeah. Would you rather go to the Indy Five set or go see Keaton be <clears throat> Batman on the Flash set? Indy Five. I think I would too. Yeah. But Keaton. But I, I think. But I'd rather go see Keaton than see Spider Man. Interesting. I understand what Gabe is saying. Like, I've done a Spider-Man set yeah, already. Sure. So, and and you're right. Like, who's going to get a chance to say this? Uh, Harrison Ford filming Indy. in, in Indiana Indy. Jones. Yeah. As Indy, yeah. So, I, uh, that's a tough call. That's a really good question, though. Similarly to Batman. It is. Yeah, it is. Um, right, well, now, I have to, now I have to review The Night House. And it's yeah. not, not nearly as exciting after that, that fun conversation. <laughs> um, I liked this movie a lot more than, than it it's sounding like other people did like there's a group of people from cinema blend who went to go see a public screening or a press screening of it uh last night and they came back and they were like what movie did you watch because i have been kind of raving about it but i really dug it um rebecca hall is fantastic in it uh what can i tell you about it um she is a widow uh this is not necessarily spoiler you learn this pretty early on she's a widow and her husband committed suicide um he put a gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger and um she is dealing with that loss and um, they live in a big house that they built together um, and she doesn't necessarily want to leave it, although everyone's sort of telling her that she probably should just for the um, memory sake of it all. And she starts to believe that she's being haunted or, you know, that she can still feel the presence of her of her dead husband. And as she begins to investigate um, a few of the things that might have led to his suicide, because he seemed like a normal guy up to that point, she starts to uncover some really disturbing things. And I'll kind of leave it at that. But um, the director is um, David Bruckner. Is that his? Mm-hmm. The director is David Bruckner. And um, we'll have him on the show next week uh, talking at length about The Night House. And he does some really and great. Hellraiser. And Hellraiser. Um, and, of, and what was the other one that's on Netflix that you were talking oh, about? Oh, The Ritual, which if you've never seen, is fantastic. I have never seen it. And I'm going to have to check it out. Um, he does some really cool things with modern technology. Uh, we talked at length with him. You'll hear it next week, uh, next week about um, horror tropes and how to either avoid them or lean into them. And one of the ways that he leans into, because he's very clearly making a haunted house movie um, and almost, you know, tweaking it for a modern age. You know, a little bit in the way that like Mike Flanagan did with Hill House, but not not as effective. I think uh, Flanagan knocked it out of the park. But like he'll do some just random things that you don't expect with like text messages um or uh cell phone photos you know like things that you see in the background of cell phone photos and it just gets under your skin and um i thought that was pretty effective the way he pulled that off i thought rebecca hall was fantastic in it she's she's it's one of those performances where she's in every single scene uh a lot of times and i asked him about this uh, also too that you'll hear like a lot of times it's just her and having to convey uh, all of these emotions in a performance all by herself and i thought she did an incredible job so i totally would recommend night house i thought it was really um that was really well done. I dug it. So if you uh, get a chance. Uh, exclusively theatrical? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. See, that, um, doesn't that seem like the kind of film, like, I would love to press play at home on that on like a Friday night. But is the timing, like when that comes to VOD, won't it be a little bit better for that? Like, won't it be closer to the fall, closer to oh, Halloween? Oh, that's a good point. Closer to... That's a good point. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. The fact that we're even having that conversation is crazy to me. Yeah. What, that Halloween's coming? Yeah. Every year. Every year. <laughs> 
I'm gonna punch you in the face. <laughs> right around the, right around the right, same time, too. Right in your stupid <laughs> ass face. All right, by this this episode is mean. It really yeah, it is. is to me from the get go. What uh, just because I'm pointing out that Halloween happens every year? Um, let's get to the blend game. We're playing Rebecca Hall blend, uh, celebrating the the tremendous filmography of Rebecca, which I tweeted when I shared this. She's had a really sneaky you know successful mm-hmm. career with some yeah. great great choices so well she kind of uh, came out swinging she had uh, uh the prestige pretty early right yeah and then yeah. Vicky Cristina Barcelona first so handful. when I was going through her filmography though like in choosing the one that I went with I wanted to go with one that was I think good because of her like sure. she's a Same. smaller part of some really great ensembles sure. um and that a little bit took the prestige out for I, me so I felt so. the same way because I couldn't super remember her part in the prestige yeah it's um, small so, so yeah, like I would argue like The Prestige is probably the best film she's ever been a part of. Yeah, but that's but I'm game. with you in that I also did. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's why I didn't. I, I like the little Gabe that sits on my shoulder was like, no, uh, uh-uh, not that one. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, yeah, no. He's, he's, like, he's, like, he's like Newman in Jurassic Park. Uh, uh, uh. I like how you say he's like Newman in Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jake, what did you go with? Um, I, tried, I went with The Town because I thought it was, the, it was a blend of a really great movie that mm-hmm. I love. You chose that too? Yes. I, I I picked it because it was the sort of like at the crossroads at the Venn diagram of like really great movie, but also a movie that is made better because of her contribution to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, her, you know, she, the, the transformation her character takes as someone that's sort of a victim and then ends up falling in love unknowingly with the person to whom she was the victim of. Um, and then and then sort of kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of realization, sort of the come to Jesus moment um, that she ends up having when she realizes who Ben Affleck's character is. Um, I just thought it was it's a really great arc um, in a movie full of great arcs for a lot of great characters played by great actors. Um, the fact, you know, she, the, every, everyone in that movie from, from Ben to, to Jeremy, to John Hamm, to, to Blake Lively has, you know, gives great performances and they all have sort of those moments where they, 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 you know, and the fact that she's right up there amongst the best of them and does some of the best work, I think says uh, a lot. So, and, and also I, I, genuinely love the town um and as much as i love it it's crazy it's not even my favorite ben affleck uh directorial effort so um uh so yeah the town for me Gabe? yes i i echo all of that i mean that's exactly the reason i chose it the the come to jesus moment that scene when she's in the bathroom he comes home and she she figures it out and the the two of them together was kind of the scene that i came to when when looking at her filmography that sort of drew me to the town um, because I think she's, you talk about her having a sneaky career also just like, I can't, there's some films that I should catch up on that I haven't seen of hers, but I don't think I've ever watched a performance of hers mm-hmm. and felt, uh, that she was miscast or felt sure. that she gave a bad performance. Like she's just yeah. kind of top notch yeah. every time mm-hmm. she comes out. Like I love Frost Nixon, but again, this is like, yes, Frost Nixon that was is the other one that I, I almost like, considered. Yeah. Yeah, she's but I was trying to this, but she, yeah, but she gets, she just, and that she is great in that, but she gets just so, so little, like overcast by Frank Langella and, and Michael Sheen. Yes, that's um, why I, because those are two sort, like that. showy, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. But, so, and one of the things on her filmography was Vicky Cristina, Barcelona, which I know that I loved. Like, I, I know it made my top 10 the year it came out. But I haven't seen him forever, and the, I mainly remember Scarlett Johansson and Javier Bardem for yeah. it. But yeah. I'm sure she's great. And, and sure. Penelope, that's the movie Penelope won the Oscar for. Yes, yes. correct, correct. Yes. Sorry, so yeah, the town for 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 that performance, I think is great. That scene in particular, even if you just go look up that scene, mm-hmm. it's you know we talk about being a little too heavy handed with like rewarding drama for the big and and large emotions, and it's kind of one of those scenes. But uh, she doesn't overdo it, and it's a great. Anytime you can give one of those performances across from Ben Affleck and it just yeah. feels like you're on par, mm-hmm. it's a great performance. I went with The Gift, um, which A lot just, of people went with that. Uh, that. The Gift blew me away. Um, what a great and she's movie. a really hard part. Yeah, it's terrific. Um, and, you know, I love that Joel Edgerton directed it. And I love that it makes really great use of Bateman um, in leaning into... Jason Bateman has that sort of undercurrent of sinisterness. He can be really really deceivingly sinister um and i think that's why what is that netflix show Ozark. that he's in yeah i think that's why that works right. so well but rebecca hall's part in that is that she has to throughout the course of this movie and it's hard to talk about because if you haven't seen it and i highly recommend that you watch the gift i don't want to give anything away but she has to um she's married to jason bateman's character and joel edgerton plays um a, a childhood friend of of bateman's character and they have a they have a past together and so rebecca hall is caught in the middle of this and she has to 
learn stuff about her husband as the story unfolds and and have some sort of relationship with Joel Edgerton's character and it could fall apart, you know, like it's without her being as good as she is, the story could really crumble and it it goes to some incredibly dark places and she is she takes us there through her performance and so um the gift is completely underrated. I just don't think enough people gave it a shot. I don't think they knew what it was and it's much much smarter than people, you know, probably give it credit for. So, that's cool. a movie I find a lot of people are still even still discovering. Yeah. 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 Well, and why wouldn't you? You know, sure. I think at that point, like no one really knew Joel Edgerton yet. He was yeah. like on the come up sort of deal. And so to hear that he directed this and, you know, he plays a little bit of a creep in the movie, sure. too. So um, that's uncomfortable. But it's really, really worth watching. Hey, guys. Miss you guys. and love you guys. I am here on vacation in Ocean City, Maryland with Lauren and her father. And I wanted to chime in on Rebecca Hall blend because She's an incredible actor, and I think that she has uh, an incredible range in terms of the films that she's done. But my particular favorite of hers has always been The Town. And I just always found that performance to be in, uh, interesting in the sense that that love story between her and Affleck and the idea that Affleck robs the bank, that she works in as an assistant manager, and then that push-pull of like their romance and their relationship and him actually falling in love with her and then knowing that he was a part of the robbery. And just that, I, just, I think that's an interesting thing to play with, and her performance really does a great job of, uh, of playing with that arc of kind of what he's going through, playing off of what he's going through, but also her unknowing of what's happening and then figuring it out as the film goes on. I just think her performance in that film is fantastic. And I just, Affleck did a great job directing that movie. I just remember being blown away emotionally by her performance, specifically, just because she's kind of the heart or the glue of the story that kind of differentiates between Affleck's intentions and obviously the other people who were involved in the robbery, including Renner, and that element of her character basically being uh, in danger if they found out that Doug was seeing her. Doug is the character that Affleck plays in the movie. So it, that performance is, is my favorite of hers. And I'll, I'll keep this short because I know you guys are in the middle of the show, uh, but that's my favorite for Rebecca Hall Blend. I'm very excited about The Night House. I know that's a, we've had the director on our show, so definitely stay tuned to that. And I miss you guys, and I love you guys very much, but Rebecca Hall Blend for me, goes to the town. I'll talk to you guys later on, on the text thread, right? All right, love you guys, bye. Okay, so Damien McDonald, uh, Ballistic Gamer, and many, many more said The Gift. Uh, Sylvia Barrera, cool. Paul Marsh, and many, many more said The Town. And Rachel Ho uh, says The Underrated Christine, which is also another great performance by Rebecca Hall, uh, and focused completely on her. So for next week, you guys can play along uh, using hashtag Coleman Domingo Blend. That's gonna oh, be really hard. Wow! That's what a good be one. Hard. I looked uh, up. I looked up his filmography, and I was yeah. like, "I was like, is this hard or is this easy?" And then I was like, "Oh, it's difficult. It's Damn. really difficult. <laughs> it's difficult." Yeah, we almost got him recently uh, to give you a little peek behind the curtain. Yeah, and um, when I looked, yeah, I did the exact same thing. I looked at his IMDb, and I was like, "God, he's worked with some incredible people." So Coleman Domingo Blend, uh, make sure that you, if you're able to see Zola before uh, weighing in on, on I'm that try choice. I'm going to something that's not Zola. Yeah, uh, so you can do it uh, using the hashtag on social media or you can email us at realblend at cinemablend.com. Damn, look at this filmography. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Uh, we have a review from someone named Me Carter 89 who says, uh, real fun show. R-E-E-L. I uh, love when people, I can people do that the right way. Uh, listening to this show is, to me, the equivalent of listening to friends chatted up at a local comic shop. Well, not this week, Carter, because uh, you got the angry version of this show. <laughs> this show. Uh, you can tell that these guys enjoy each other's company and the subject of film. They approach each subject, each subject with great insight and honesty. I appreciate the fact that they are very honest about how they feel about a film, even right after interviewing the director. Yes, today's a good example. Yeah. I hope Neil. I hope Neil punches out before. Uh, we get to the review it is such a natural and comfortable setting each time i hit play and i look forward to each episode thank you very much me carter 89 for taking the time to reach out to us um so we're gonna be back next week with uh actually we have a couple of things dropping next week i won't tease them out fully here because you never know how things are going to shake out but we have some exciting interviews we have we i have can to say run. um you mentioned bruckner i did we i can confirm because i have the footage sitting on my computer unless there's some catastrophic failure Right. I have not yet noticed because it was right before we recorded this. We sat down with David Lowry, Lowry! To, to talk yes. about the Green Knight. And it, was and awesome. it is an amazing interview. Yeah. <laughs> it was too short. We could have gone another hour. Yes. Um, 
but it is a great interview that you guys will enjoy next week. Our next uh, premium episode is the IMDb game, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, no hints as to who won, but um, he's smirking right now. Uh, again, you can get access this to this. This is just my face. And all episodes uh, of the Real Blend Premium at cinemablend.com backslash Real Blend Premium. A reminder that Friday we have the Ishana Shyamalan uh, bonus episode dropping, and that is a must listen to. Oh my god! So In the much meantime, stuff. so much stuff. So much, it's like an abundance of content from Real Blend. Uh, follow us on social media at Jake's Takes at Kevin McCarthy TV at Sean underscore O'Connell and at Gabe Kovach. The show is at Real Blend. Kevin will be back next week. Um, I will be in Las Vegas, but we'll record from there. And Jake will be as handsome as ever. Talk to you guys next week. The um, Lost World. Link oh, it. that's a good one. I love, I love The Lost World. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Also, also great. Ooh.